Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, good evening. My name is Michael Willi, I'm Novartis' Chief Communications Officer, and it's a great pleasure to be here with you tonight and have the honor to welcome all of you to the Novartis Lecture, the first since we opened the campus last October. And please accept our apologies for the little delay, but so many of you decided to come tonight, so it took a while to fill this amazing space. And also today's event marks a special moment in the more than 10 year history of this lecture series, as we will have a chance to reflect on our own campus here and its value as a place for inspiration. Our guest speaker, cognitive neuroscientist Colin Ellert, will take us on an intellectual data-backed journey that will not only shed light on our own workplace, but show us the truly amazing power of architecture on our well-being and creativity. As you all know, we started to build that campus more than 20 years ago, and it's been designed as a state-of-the-art workplace to attract and retain great people from all parts of the world to do amazing work here together. And we have developed a fantastic structure of labs and offices, as well as places to relax, such as parks and squares, all with a very clear and attractive urban design. You see, I'm in love with this campus. <laughs> I'm actually also a local native of the city of Basel, so I also have some patriotic feelings when I talk about it. And we're continuing to develop that campus. Over the last few years um, alone, we've built a new radial ligand lab here in Basel. We also recently um, opened Banting One. This is the building with the massive um, waves in front of it, where we have pulled our diverse chemistry research efforts um, 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 on, this, on this campus, actually for Novartis as a whole. And next year, we will welcome the FMI, the Friedrich Miescher Institute here on campus, and maybe in a few years from now, the IOB as well, and some other great institutions. Clearly, also an adjusted company strategy, and the pandemic provided some challenges to the initial vision of the Novartis campus. So today we have a need for fewer people to work here. The, init the initial master plan actually has foreseen um, space for 14,000, even up to 18,000 people. And as you're all aware, we don't need to have 14,000 or 18,000 people here um, coming together and working together. And also the convenience of remote working um, in, in today's digital work environment has led to a more controversial discussion about the bricks and mortar workplace and what we should do within the bricks and the mortar. And international collaboration is certainly benefiting a lot from today's digital collaboration and communication tools. However, one thing that we have truly come to appreciate over the past few years is that collaboration and dialogue still work best when we all meet, when we as people meet in physical space something actually humanity has been doing for thousands of years, and I believe from which our brains may never unwire. At least, I hope so. This deeply rooted idea, this deeply rooted belief, also inspired us to build the Novartis Pavilion, um, which we have designed as a space for encounter, of dialogue, and innovation. And when you came to in into campus, you saw it on the right side. And just for the case you haven't had an opportunity to visit it and to visit its exhibition, I can recommend you to take a couple of hours and do so, and I guarantee you, you won't regret that. We have also opened the Novartis campus to the public to invite people from Basel, from the region, and from all parts of the world to be part of our journey and further open our space for interactions and that interactions that can change the course of science and, and medicine. So we have high ambitions here. Now today is also not uncommon, and that's, um, that's really great to see young children playing at, on the forum in front of this building, the Gary building, or running around our koi fish pond, or seeing tourists um, um, curiously crossing the campus, or meeting elderly people strolling through the parks and squares hand in hand, and just actually enjoying their time here on campus. For me, that's the magic of this place, which I think is returning with full force again, and you're a testament to this as well. Dear colleagues, dear guests, Colin Ellert 
and will have much to say about the current state of the workplace, the role of architecture, and its power to inspire us. As a cognitive neuroscientist at the University of Waterloo and the director of its Urban Realities Laboratory, Elliot is working at the intersection of urban design and experimental psychology, studying the impact of spaces on our lives, be it our mental state, our health, our well-being, or our behaviors in general. Colin also tries to understand the inner workings of all these relations. A big task and maybe something that never ends. With this, I'd like to close my short introduction and invite Colin onto the stage. Thanks for your attention. Colin, the floor is yours. Hello. I brought an umbrella with me. I'm hoping that I won't need it. Um, I'm just so uh, grateful to Novartis for inviting me here to speak to you in this extraordinary location about some of my passions. Um, I, I, uh, even though, though I've only been here for a couple of days, I think that I've also fallen a little bit in love with Novartis campus. And I hope that some of the things that I say don't come off as though I'm a gushing fanboy, although I fear a little bit maybe I am at this point. Um, I won't spend any more time on, on preamble because I have a lot that I want to tell you about. So I'll, I'll begin my, my story here. When I was five years old, my father took me to Stonehenge. That was a long time ago, at a time when it was basically just us and the stones on the windswept Salisbury Plain. There were no fences, snack shops, or souvenir shops. It was just us. And I still remember so vividly the impressions that I had of the site, which were primarily emotional. I felt, um, I'll describe later on a lot, of, a lot of my thoughts about awe, but I felt awe, although I might not have used that word as a five-year-old. I felt a little bit of anxiety, almost a feeling of foreboding, a sense that I was in the presence of something that was important. And little did I know at that time, but that experience and many later experiences came to, uh, I guess, define who I am and, and what I'll talk about. So Stonehenge was, was built, uh, begun about 5,000 years ago, an almost unimaginable reach of time for us. But it's actually not, by a long shot, the oldest kind of human construction that we know about. And one of the very oldest that we know about is, is this uh, structure called Gebek Gebekli Tepe, which is in southern Turkey. And Gebekli Tepe, as far as can be guessed, was built about 7,000 years before Stonehenge. So again, an unimaginably long time in our past. And that timing is actually truly significant because 12,000 years ago, what that means is that this was before the birth of agriculture. This was before people lived in large groups in cities, even in towns. The average group size would have been something like 100 people. And we know, and you can, you can probably tell just from looking at this, that this would have been a hard task for a group of 100 people to manage, which means that for some reason, people came together who didn't live together in order to construct Gebekli Tepe. So the, this, the modern discoverer of these ruins, uh, an, anthro uh, an, anthro an, anthro an archeologist, sorry, named Klaus Schmidt, uh, famously said of the site, first came the temple and then the city. And what he meant by that was that this was not uh, as far as we can tell, a structure that was designed for the pragmatic purposes that we often associate with, with architecture. This was not something that was designed as a, as a dwelling place. Nobody lived at Gobekli Tepe. People visited from other places. Um, and so again, like as with Stonehenge, what this suggests is that the, the very origins of architecture, the very origins of building things, probably had to do with things other than the pragmatics and probably had to do with the sense of uh, building something perhaps as a bulwark against our, our fear of mortality, as a place of healing, as a place of succor from all of the terrible things that might have been present in one's environment, as a place to go 
to celebrate one's health or celebrate the death of somebody in one's family. In other words, the very origins of architecture had to do with their effects on our emotional state, I believe, rather than their pragmatic functions. So if you think about any building that you know, this building, any other building, of course, a building has to work. It has to be for something, and it has to support the functions that it's for. But there are also many other things that architecture, buildings in general, do for us and do to us. They affect our psychological state and even, as I'll show you, our neurological state. The kinds of things that our brains and our bodies are doing are affected very strongly by, by where we are. And I think that's terribly important to bear in mind when you think about uh, what buildings and architecture and larger scale urban settings are actually for and what they're doing. And then I come here to Novartis campus where um, I see this really tantalizing thread that connects these very ancient constructions that were, as far as we know, dedicated to promoting healing and the Novartis campus, this company that is dedicated to extending, perhaps, and also enriching people's lives by uh, having positive effects on their health. So for me, it's a lovely arc to think of going from 12,000 years ago to today, this, this fantastic um, architectural creation at Novartis. Okay, so I'm going to give you, a, a, and this will be really short, a, a, a basic crash course in, in architectural psychology. So architectural psychology has been around as a thing actually for quite some time. So it's not unusual, for example, in a school of architecture for students to learn a few things about some uh, psychologists, maybe sometimes not always the, the right ones. There's still lots of discussion of Sigmund Freud and, and Carl Jung. And, and maybe a little bit of, bit of discussion of more modern psychology. But in the last 10 or 20 years, there has been this increasing trend for architects and planners to take more seriously the possibility that our psychology and the design of our brains might be able to inform us about good building practices and at least illuminate the different ways that buildings can affect us. So, there has been a discovery, that, this is no longer new news, but um, a, a neuroscientist named Giacomo Rizzolatti discovered these marvelous neurons that he called mirror neurons. And he, he called them mirror neurons because they have this really interesting property that if you record their activity, they respond when, uh, these were experiments in, in monkeys, in rhesus monkeys, they responded when the monkeys did something most commonly something like picking up and grasping a piece of food. But the mirror part was that these very same neurons responded when that monkey saw someone else, either another rhesus monkey or even a person, pick up an object. So Rizzolatti said, aha, so these neurons are actually firing in the same way for my doing something as they are for my seeing something being done. And Rizzolatti's discovery unleashed a torrent of activity and truthfully, some speculation in, uh, in neuroscience and psychology about what the function of these neurons might be. And there's an obvious pathway, if you think about this, to ideas about, for example, the, the underlying neural basis of something like empathy. How is it that um, I'm able to feel what you feel? Well, it's because I have neurons that, that actually do what they see uh, that fire when they see you doing something in the same way that they do when I do it. So there's this kind of conceptual arc to empathy. In line with that as well, there's an idea, a little bit of an older idea, of something called embodiment, or sometimes called embodied simulation. And the crux of this idea is that the way that we understand other people, and maybe, as you'll see, not just people, but things as well, is that we embody their activation. We take into ourselves, in our own bodies, the things that we see in the external world and understand those things by mapping them onto our own bodies. Okay, so as I said, it's not, it's not just buildings that we might have um, embodied simulation, or sorry, it's not just people that we might have embodied simulations for, it's also buildings. And this, I think, is a wonderful example. This is um, Bernini's uh, uh, Baldacini, uh, 
for the um, uh, in in St. Peter's Cathedral in in the Vatican, and the architectural theorist Harry Mulgrave talked to me about this Baldacini, and he said, you know, if you look at those columns and the twists and turns that they take, it's the 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 idea of suffering, the suffering of uh, at a, a, of somebody who is dying, is almost palpable. And so that's an example, he said, of how we might embody the feelings that are invoked by a piece of architecture. Here's another example. Here's a much more friendly example. We're, we're sitting in a Frank Gehry building right now. This is another uh, Gehry creation, the, the so-called golden fish, named that for obvious reasons. It's basically a golden fish. It's nice how the world works sometimes. This is in Barcelona. The, um, the characteristic graceful curves of a Gary building, including this one, also have an effect on us. At a very deep level, we love curves. We're attracted to curves whether we're looking at them or whether we're walking through them. Um, and so Gary taps into those kind of joyous, playful feelings of, of curves in many of his designs. And also, it's very obvious in this case, and almost as obvious in the case of the building that we're in, that there's some biomorphism to these forms. And in, in other words, they're, they're inspired by biological forms. This, again, obviously a fish. I just learned today that Gary's inspiration for this building was a heart. So again, a biological form which is filled with, with interesting curvature. Here's another example. Um, <laughs> everybody here, I'm sure, has experienced the phenomenon of what the, the, the boffins call pari pareidolia. That is, we see faces where uh, there aren't faces. Some of us see this all the time. I can almost guarantee you that over the next few minutes and maybe even the next day or two, you're going to have a lot more pareidolic experiences than you had before, because um, I'll show you a few more. So the interesting thing about pareidolia is this. We, it turns out that we have a part of our brains that is dedicated to processing information from faces and facial expressions. And if you think about it, this makes Absolutely perfect sense. If you think about your day-to-day -day conduct as a human being, understanding how other people feel is obviously really important to your success in life. And understanding that, a part of that understanding at least, comes from being able to interpret facial expressions. So we actually have an area of the brain, which I show on the right side of this slide, called the fusiform face area, that is dedicated to processing information from faces and processing information about facial expressions. But the thing of it is, we can't turn off the fusiform face area. So even when we're looking at things that aren't, aren't extrinsically faces, we can still process them as if they were. And this can be as true for <laughs> buildings as it is for any other kind of object, including uh, the common kind of uh, coat hooks that I just showed you. There's a marvelous piece of research. This is a little bit of an homage to Switzerland as well, I guess. Um, there's a, a, an, an Australian architectural theorist named Michael Ostwald who had the idea of taking, thinking about the things that I've just said, taking um, facial expression recognition software, which we now know is pretty common uh, and sometimes works kind of okay-ish, um, using that kind of technology and pointing it at buildings. So can a machine have a pareidolic experience of a, of a building? And if it did, what would it tell us? And so one of the buildings that Ostwald used was uh, the building that you see here. Uh, this is very famous. Every architect knows this building, the Villa Savoy, designed by the Swiss architect Le Corbusier. And people have really mixed reactions to this piece of architecture. It's a real love-hate thing. And one of the, the most interesting points I have found from Ostwald's work was that when he pointed the facial expression recognition algorithms at this building, he picked up a lot of anger. This is kind of an angry building. <laughs> OK, so just a, a quick summary. What I've tried to convey to you is, first of all, this idea that architecture may have as its primal purpose in the earliest kinds of things that we, as human beings, ever built to sculpt human thought and perhaps even especially emotion. And that great architecture, current architecture, wittingly or not, and more and more often wittingly, as architects become more conversant with this entirely other realm of discourse in neuroscience and psychology, with the design features of the, of the human brain. So, so in part, buildings work because of the way that they engage these sometimes very deeply rooted properties of brains. 
Okay, now I want to talk about, of course, given that it's the title of my talk, <laughs> it should not surprise you, but I want to talk about environments for inspiration. So I'll eventually get to the Novartis campus, but I want to tell you about a couple of other uh, places first. This is, um, as you can see from the caption, the Basilica di San Francesco di Sisi. It's a, a, a religious structure in Assisi in Italy. And the reason that I put it here is because of a story about Jonas Salk, the, the, uh, the inventor, I suppose you'd say, of the polio vaccine. Salk was, uh, spent a lot of time um, trying to figure out how to make an effective vaccine. And at some point in his travails, he became blocked. He just couldn't figure out the answers to the questions that he was asking. So he did what many of us might think to do, which is to remove himself, and this will turn out to be really quite important, to remove himself from his, his everyday existence and go somewhere else and just try to incubate for a while. And that, that word incubate will come back too. So he went here, and somehow the magic worked, and he claimed that being at this site and then coming back to his regular workplace helped him to unblock and do the things that he needed to do, think the thoughts that he needed to think to solve the problems. Somewhat later on, Jonas Salk, so in, the, in this image you can see Salk on the, on the left and in the middle is a, a very famous architect named Louis Kahn and on the right side is the, is the man who helped to raise all of the money for, for Salk to uh, uh, reach his aspirational dreams which was that Salk was given more or less carte blanche to figure out how to design a space that would encourage creativity, would encourage inspiration, would encourage the kinds of aha or eureka moments that we hope to have in science's greatest discoveries. And in Salk's view, and his thinking was helped along by this uh, for certain by Louis Kahn, he thought that there were se several key properties, which I've listed here just as openness, awareness and connection. So by openness, I mean that both in a strictly spatial sense, but also in a metaphorical sense, Kahn thought that a place of discovery should have lots of wide open space. And the thinking here was no more sophisticated, but that doesn't mean it wasn't right, was no more sophisticated than thinking that, that metaphorically, if you're in wide open spaces, it's going to encourage you to have wide open thoughts, to entertain a wider range of possibilities. He also thought awareness was important. So the, st the structure that was eventually built, and I'll show, you, show it to you on the next slide, he thought it was an important feature that that structure be away from everyday life in just the same way that he was away from everyday life during his pilgrimage to Assisi. Um, so the, the structure was eventually built on a piece of beautiful landscape that was not all that close to, um, to other settings. So the closest town, um, La Jolla in California is about a 15, 20 minute drive or a longer walk. Um, so there's a wayness. But he also thought the connection was important. That seems almost like a, a, a paradox. But the kind of connection he meant was that he thought it was important to design a setting where there was an intensity of community among the practitioners, the scientists, the discoverers on that site. So while they were segregated from everyday life, they were together as an intensively engaged community with great awareness of what each other was doing uh, to contribute to whatever discoveries they were working on. So this is what, what Kahn and Salk came up with, the, the Salk Institute on the coast of California. Uh, you're looking at a view of the Institute now, now facing east, and that'll be important for reasons that you'll see in just a second. You can see that there's this lovely wide open space, this wide open courtyard that runs down the middle of the Salk Institute, and on either side, embracing that open space, you can see uh, buildings. Those buildings are composed of both offices and lab spaces. The windows that you can see here, oddly, it seems a little odd that they're all facing the same direction, but they're all facing west, and the reasons for that are really important, as, I'll see, as you'll see when I flip you around and show you the other view. The labs were beside the offices, and um, Salk was insistent that the labs be as open as possible. So he said, don't, don't bind people into cubicles where they don't know what's going on. Make sure that the spaces are flexible, that the principal investigators have lots of latitude to arrange things as they want to, but also make sure that there's lots of connectivity between uh, different labs. 
Now, if you turn around and look in the other direction, this is facing west. And you can see this uh, glorious, uh, they call it a reflecting pool, which I've always thought is a, it doesn't look very poolish to me, but maybe a reflecting channel that you can see runs down the center of the courtyard and um, flows into, on the other side of that courtyard is ocean. So it flows into the ocean. So symbolically, what Salk and Khan were after was the idea that this was what connected the Salk Institute to the, to the greater world, that they spoke to the world via this channel that went right onto the ocean. But there was this other really special um, feature of the channel, and I heard, as I put up the picture, I heard just a few people go, hmm. Um, this is a special day, as the caption says. This is autumnal equinox. And the special thing about autumnal equinox is that the sun sets exactly due west, just on that day. So on that day, when the sun sets there, it sets exactly in the middle of that channel. Um, it also happens in the spring equinox. So for two days a year, you have this. Now, I go to um, periodically go to a conference of most of the architects and a few uh, scientists at the Salk Institute. And my first experience with the Salk was that I, um, I arrived at, there was a banquet on the second day. I arrived at the banquet and I sat down with everyone else to start eating. The food was halfway served, and then suddenly everybody leapt out of their chairs, and they ran outside. And I had no idea of any of this, so I thought, what is going on? Was there you know, a bomb threat? Was there a, a fire alarm? Did they get advance word of the rubber chicken? I wasn't sure. Um, but what they were doing was this. They were all scrambling outside to see the sunset, because by, not by coincidence at all, the conference was set so that the autumnal equinox was right in the middle of the the sunset. So this is a, a gaggle of architects. It always tickles me a little bit how many of them were, were looking at the sunset through their phones rather than in the unmediated direct experience. But I guess maybe that's a statement we can make about a lot of different human behaviors right now. OK, so that's the sulk. Here's a smaller setting. This is the Perimeter Institute in, uh, in, in my small town of, of Waterloo, Ontario. It's an institute devoted to theoretical physics. Um, it has the same kinds of key elements, I think, as the Salk Institute, but on smaller scale. It's in a nice uh, open setting. Uh, there are open spaces, including inside the building. It is detached from the town, um, but also connected with the town. So uh, the, the community of scholars in the perimeter have intensive connection with one another. But there's also a little bit of connection with the, uh, with the rest of the town. So what I mean by that is that for the most part, people who live in, or any, any uh, of the general public aren't allowed into the Perimeter Institute. But there are certain times when they are. There, are. there are concerts, there are sometimes lectures, there's a lovely restaurant, and very occasionally, the public is invited in to, to share these events. And I think having that kind of, of mediated intermixing between the general public and the people who work at the PI um, is really interesting and perhaps important because it heightens for the people in the surrounding area the sense that something really special is going on here. And indeed, special things are happening and have happened at the Perimeter Institute. But it also heightens for the people who work there the sense that, that this, is a, this is a somewhat segregated, special environment. This is a place where people want to come um, but aren't, aren't always able to come. So some similarities with the Sulk. And now we come to uh, where, where we are now, the Novartis campus. So does this campus share those kinds of properties um, of things like the Salk Institute and the Perimeter Institute? Um, I, th I think, yeah, but the, the, the difference in scale is, is for me sort of mind blowing. Um, there is certainly openness here. And if you look at this overhead view, it doesn't look terribly open. But as you walk through campus, you know that it feels open. And that's no accident. It's a, a result of the careful planning of the campus. For example, the dimensions of the walkways between buildings and the scale of the buildings that allow lots of light and air to permeate wherever you are on the campus. So there's this wonderful openness that's produced in a different way, an ingenious way in Novartis campus. And it also has those properties of, of awareness in the sense that it's it's kind of interdigitated with the town, and it's kind of not. It's a separate thing. Um, but also intensity of community. There's something special 
uh, I think, among the people who work here uh, that, that allows that kind of intensively social interaction. So another quick summary, these are, at least in the intuitive approaches to, to the design of, dis design of discovery workplaces, the kinds of things that have been considered to be important. Wide open spaces, being away, and being together. So that's the intuition, which, of course, is often, intuition is often right, not always. What about the science? Well, um, so I'm going to take a little pause to moisten my lips. The, the science of creativity is interesting, complicated, and in many ways a little bit unsatisfactory. And I say that because, as you'll see, I think that the most precious parts of the creative, the creative process are the ones that we actually understand less about. Um, going back to, this is not, this is not my idea. This, this idea of the way to break down the creative process goes back to uh, about the 1920s. And as scientists, what we like to do is to take a big, hard to understand thing, and when we can, break it down into smaller, more uh, tangible, tractable things. So we talk about the creative process as being divided into four main stages, preparation, incubation, illumination, and verification. So the preparation and verification stages are uh, respectively where we first begin to investigate the problem, to understand what it is that we're trying to understand or what the problem is that we're trying to solve. And then the elaboration and validation at the other end of the process has to do with when we've made our discovery, figuring out whether we've made a valid discovery. Are we on the right track? Is this a real thing? Does it have legs? In the middle is... As a scientist, I suppose I shouldn't use the word magic, but in the middle is, is sort of where the magic happens. The incubation and illumination phases that are so precious and ephemeral that we know that a lot of unconscious processing goes on uh, when we incubate. Once we've thought about all of the possibilities, then we go off and we incubate. Uh, and then hopefully there's an illumination, the so-called eureka phase, the eureka moment. Now, as far as environments for discovery are concerned, the interesting thing about that is that different phases of the creative process, if you buy into this subdivision of the different parts of the process, different phases are supported by different kinds of environments. So that first and last phase, preparation and verification, I think they're intensively social. I think that you can do preparation all by yourself, um, but it's much more difficult than preparing in a group and brainstorming all of the different kinds of ways of understanding the problem they're trying to solve. And I think verification, again, as a solo act is, is much more difficult than as a group activity. So how does the environment support uh, social interaction? Well, look at the Novartis campus. The, uh, one of the stunning things for me about this campus is the number of different kinds of spaces, beautiful spaces, that enable, that afford social interaction. So in architecture and even in psychology, um, we have ways of figuring out how to uh, get people to go to particular places. Um, we um, have ways based on the raw geometry of, say, the inside of a building to figure out how to make that happen. So you've probably heard the, uh, the mantra that's often repeated in the, in the glossy business magazines about, hey, what you want to do is increase the frequency of serendipitous encounters. So you want to find ways to make it so that people who don't work together bump into each other like, like, uh, like balls in a pinball machine, let's say, um, in their working environment. But the other side of this that's important to consider is has to go with the, the old aphorism, you can lead a horse to water, but that's not the same as making it drink. So it's one thing to get people to, to bump into each other, but it's something else entirely to get people to bump into each other somewhere where they actually like to be, somewhere that's pleasant, somewhere that's beautiful, ideally immersed in nature, nature is special, and um, I've lost count of the number of spaces that, that fit those requirements on this campus. So one of the things that I really like about the campus and that has made me fall in love a little bit is, again, just the variety of these spaces, and not just the nature spaces with the, the beautiful casual arrangement of, of seating, but also the moving spaces, the, uh, the, the, the main walkways and these fantastic arcades 
Um, every arcade is a little bit different, but they all uh, connect to one, other, to one another in some fashion. And arcades are really interesting psychologically because along with the pragmatics of doing things like giving you chances to get out of the weather if you're outside and you bump into somebody and you want to chat for a minute, you don't have to stand in the rain, um, they do that. But there's also a sense in which people are more likely to let down their guard and be intimate with one another if they're in a space that has some enclosure. So there are fascinating studies, for example, in, in the design of hospitals where even if uh, a, a little arcade-like structure is almost accidentally included in a building, if you watch how people interact and measure carefully, you notice that the nature of interactions in those kinds of spaces are different to interactions in other parts of a hospital space. One tangible example is that doctors are much more likely to be honest with nurses, for example, about their uncertainties in making a diagnosis than they might be in, for example, a procedure room. So another fascinating impact of the design of space on how we relate to one another. OK, um, how to get from from good to great. So this is, this is the hard part. This is the part where I think there are lots of unknowns. How do we design environments that encourage the incubation and illumination stages? What supports unconscious processing and especially what supports that eureka moment? I think that there are some good cues in environmental psychology as to the kinds of things that, that might work. And I've listed three of them here that I'll talk briefly about each of them, what I'll call awe and epiphany and wandering and novelty, and then finally, and I'll kind of fold this into wandering and novelty, exposure to nature. So beginning with awe, awe and epiphany are, as I've said here, the enemies of priming. And priming is the enemy of creativity. What I mean by that is that, and you all know this from creative acts that you've been engaged in in your own lives, if you're trying to come up with a creative solution to a problem, one of the biggest barricades to that is being trapped into old ways of thinking about something. So it can be incredibly difficult to put aside what you know or think you know and look at something with fresh eyes. So that's that following what you know or think you know, that's, that's priming. And one way to ameliorate that is through awe and epiphany. So psychologists these days are very interested in the awe experience. And we say that awe consists of two different elements, immensity and epiphany. So immensity can be obvious, the kind of obvious spatial immensity, a very large space, perhaps an open space, a huge building that elicits part of the awe, awe response. Epiphany is a little bit different, but can be connected to immensity. By epiphany in awe research, we talk about the idea that something has changed the way that you see the world. So hopefully you're seeing a connection here with the creative process. So, when you're in a situation that elicits awe, and, and most commonly this might happen, for example, if you're in the presence of a truly majestic piece of architecture, it might be if you're witness to a, a, a truly uh, thunderous uh, piece of weather, a huge thunderstorm, but it can also be uh, a different kind of immensity, the awe that we might have at the intellect of someone like a Stephen Hawking, for example might also elicit an awe response. So there's this combination of immensity and epiphany. And we know, this is from a little work that, that I've done in my lab, we know that there are predictors of what will produce an awe response in, in architecture. And I've listed here the, the, the main factors, according to studies that we've done, of what might produce an awe response in people in, a, in an architectural setting. Uh, again, immensity and even si simple things like the height of a ceiling, the overall size of a structure, um, adornment, this is really interesting, imagery and art, um, and especially the impression that something has been really hard that has taken a lot of effort to produce. So think of a building that you've been in that has lots of, for example, ornate uh, sculpture. Going back to St. Peter's Basilica, if you've been there, that would be a great example of a structure that inside is dripping with beautiful art and um, evidence of effort. And then light. Light is really important to the awe experience as well. Um, windows and natural light. And so then uh, we come to Novartis. Uh, there, there are so many examples that I've experienced over the last couple of days of locations that have generated in me 
experiences of awe and especially um, epiphany. And I'll, I'll focus a little bit more on those a little bit later in my talk. The, the reason that we're interested in the awe experiences is because of the, uh, the points that I list on this slide. When we experience awe, and for some time afterwards, we're less prone to cognitive bias. What I mean by that is, is that, again, you all know this, that sometimes you're prone to believing things that aren't necessarily true. We have, we talk about this a lot these days, our proneness to succumbing to weak arguments. It happens especially in uh, uh, politics, for example, where um, politicians know that there are ways that they can encourage us to believe things that aren't actually all that true because we have these inbuilt cognitive biases. The fascinating thing about an awe experience is that those biases subside a little bit for some time after we've experienced awe. Um, we're more attuned to vastness after an awe experience. So we're more sensible of experiences of immensity, uh, including the immensity of ideas. The ground is opened up to our thinking about the greater kinds of possibilities in our thinking. And also, interestingly, we become more pro-social, which might also help along the social interaction parts of the creative process. People who've experienced awe, and this makes sense if you think about it, part of the epiphany of an awe experience is often recognizing how small we are in the grand scheme of things. So recognizing that smallness and vulnerability makes us more likely to reach out and help other human beings, um, which could also help in the creative process. OK, so wandering novelty uh, and nature and divergent thinking. So I mentioned a little while ago that, that in some ways, creativity research I find a little bit unsatisfying. And part of the reason beca is because we have such great difficulty figuring out how to measure creativity in an experiment. So we often talk about what's called divergent thinking. And there's a standard laboratory task for divergent thinking. Um, and it's this. Uh, think of an object, say a button. And think of how many different things you could use a button for. And I'll, I, we won't do this, but I'll give you, if I was doing this in an experiment, I would give you some period of time, like two or three minutes, for you to list all of the alternative uses of a button you can think of. And the idea is that the more alternate uses you can think of, the more creative you are. And I think there's some sense to that, but I think that there are limits to the sense of that when you think about what it takes to go from the kind of um, divergent thinking that might help you with thinking of uses for a button to developing something like uh, a vaccine, uh, an mRNA vaccine, for example. There's, there seems to be a problem of scaling of those kinds of ideas. Um, OK. so. In terms of the settings, um, I want to talk about uh, the influence of movement in architecture on the way that we feel and the way that our, our minds work. So a long time ago, Johann Wolfgang Goethe, the, the poet scientist, wouldn't it be cool to be known as a poet scientist, um, said uh, famously, architecture is frozen music. Um, and I've always thought that was a funny thing to have said, because to me, architecture is not frozen. Architecture might be music, and what unfreezes it is the behavior of the person immersed in the architecture. So as you move through a space, different things happen to you. And those different things that happen to you, those different architectural experiences define how that space is acting on you. Some of the best work in this area, I think, was conducted by um, Ryuso Ono who did a lot of research looking at the impact of Asian gardens. And the wonderful thing about Asian gardens, if you've experienced them, is that they are so carefully planned, and they're planned for movement. So a master designer of these gardens will think about and measure and plan every single footfall that you take and every single adjustment of gaze. They are able to predict where all of these things are happening, and they're able to use those predictions to great effect in producing an emotional impact. So Ono actually measured this in, in very fine detail. The image that you're looking at shows a map of a garden. And the, uh, the, uh, the display at the bottom of, of the slide shows Ono's measurements of places where people slowed down and places where people stopped as they walked through this setting. And you can see if you, it's, it's, I'm sure, too small for you to pick out all of the details. But you can see at least that there's some commonalities, where each of those lines represents a different person. 
people are slowing down and stopping sometimes in exactly the same places. All evidence of the success of the design of the master architect of the Asian garden. So it's not just in Asian gardens that this happens. It happens all the time, whether you're aware of it or not. Your behavior, the way that you deploy attention, how you move, where you slow down, where you pause, is affected by your surroundings. So here again is a little bit of data from, uh, from my lab. Um, that was rude because those are people from my lab that I just scanned past really quickly. These are people from my lab pretending to be uh, participants in a study. You can see that they're wired up with um, uh, different kinds of uh, devices to measure their brain waves, their eye movements, and in some cases even uh, the what's called electrodermal ac activity, which is what I'm showing here. So this is uh, a walk through part of New York City. Uh, those blue contours that you see represent the average physiological arousal of people walking down a series of streets. And you can see the only thing to take away from this is the fact that it changes, that in uh, well-designed streets, uh, things change. They go up and down in terms of our arousal state and many other things as well. Here's another way of, of seeing that. Um, this was a study that we did looking at the impact of landscape architecture on people's brain states. So the small thumbnail sketches that you see at the top of the slide show three different lo locations. This was in the city of Toronto that vary in the amount of green uh, that's in that location. And what we found was that the greenest locations produce the most alpha activity. And alpha activity is the state of your brain when you're kind of a little bit disengaged from the exigencies of everyday life. You're, uh, you're mind wandering, you're, you're drifting, uh, you're feeling pretty good. That's more likely to happen in some places than others. And the right part of this slide shows you that there's actually a part of your brain that is devoted to processing this kind of information and drawing you towards nature. So human beings have a natural affinity for nature. And when we find it and immerse ourselves in it, it actually changes the way that our brains work in ways that I think are conducive to creativity. Um, there are lots of wonderful examples of um, settings, surprising settings, things that, that I've stumbled on over the last few days that have completely blown me away in their unexpectedness and I know have changed the patterns of activity in my brains. Who would expect to find a, a beautiful meadow full of wildflowers in uh, a, a large pharmaceutical company's headquarters? Who would expect to find, I spent a lot of time yesterday in this little tiny building. It's called the Bee Opera. And it's, um, I don't have time to explain to you, if I even could, what's in the Bee Opera, but it's absolutely phenomenal. And I, I, I sat in this, uh, this little building with a few other people yesterday, and we ended up, I don't know how long we were even in there. It, it, it seemed like it was longer than expected, I would say. Um, and, and when we were in there, the way that we were thinking and talking to one another completely changed. And when we came out, there was a lingering effect. Suddenly, the relationships among the people in the group were different. And we were, we were brainstorming in, in all kinds of really interesting ways. OK, I'm getting close to the end of my talk now. I, I lost track of the time. I hope that I haven't gone too egregiously over time. Am I good? OK, thank you, Nelly. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the neuroscience of eureka, eureka. So this is the really hard part. This is, what do we know about, um, for example, the, the design of brains and how the designs of brains can be changed or altered or influenced to make those eureka moments more, uh, more likely? In recent years, and again, this is not this recent, although the thinking about this part of the brain has, has really changed over the last few years, uh, the discovery of something called the default mode network. And I've shown you a, a brain imaging slide here so you know. There's evidence that if you show people a picture of a brain, they're much more likely to believe everything that you say afterwards. <laughs> That's an example of cognitive bias. So don't necessarily buy this. But I'm telling you that there's a network of areas that seem to work together. And they were originally called the default mode network because the thinking was that this is kind of like the state that a brain is in when it's idling. And then when we turn on to do something like uh, cook a meal or uh, put together a model, or I'm thinking of weird examples, but anyway, you get the point, that when we're focused, when we're executive processing some particular problem, 
the default mode network shuts down. Well, it turns out the default mode network is a lot more interesting than that. The default mode network is thought to underlie the kinds of brain states that we might uh, experience when we're in modes of thinking and acting that would enhance creativity. So in other words, when the default mode network is active, um, the, default, the default mode network is active, you might be uh, more disposed to mind wander, to think about things that have happened, maybe imagine uh, future events, to mull things over, to in kind of an effortless, um, pleasant way kind of think about, um, not even necessarily consciously think about your surroundings, but just kind of, I want to use the very scientific word mull, uh, when you mull things over, your, your default mode network is active. There's some other interesting things about this network. One of them is that if you look at the right side of this slide, um, this is from a study where the researchers looked at the connectivity of the default mode network as it related to trait measurement of creativity. So what I mean by that is that they, they measured using, again, that, that that um, alternate uses task. They measured how creative people were based simply on how well they did on the, on the alternate uses task, how many different uses they came up with for, again, for example, a button. And then they looked at the relationship between those creativity measures and the actual connectivity of, of, of the, the DMN, and they discovered that there were differences between the high creative and the low creative individuals. So that's what's being shown without going through all of the the, the brain scan uh, details on the right side. It's basically showing that there are differences that you can see between the high creative network and the low creative network. And in a nutshell, the difference is that in the high creative network, the connections among the structures of the default mode network were stronger. So that's great. We have this evidence that there are brain differences between people who are highly creative as a, as a trait and people who aren't. But the really important question, I think, is what kinds of things strengthen the default mode network? What kinds of things are likely to make the default mode, ne mode network uh, more active? And we know that nature is a big one. We know that immersion in nature turns on the default mode network. If you think back to the slide that I showed you of increased alpha activity when we're, when we're immersed in nature, that's connected again with that same network. If you think about Wandering, and especially wandering through an environment like this one, where it seems like almost around every corner, there's a new epiphany, there's a new unexpected occasion or occurrence or feature. Those kinds of wanderings through interestingly complex environments, not chaotic, like not super complex, but interestingly complex, that middle value that you see here on, on campus, um, that's also more likely to uh, increase activity in the DMN and also um, appreciating beauty. So there's some nice evidence that when you're in the presence of even something like a beautiful piece of art, you're more likely to have DMN activity. Because of course, when you're engaging with the artwork, your mind is going to all kinds of different places, as it did with us yesterday in the, in the B Opera building. Um, I'm sure that if we were all sitting in there with brain imaging devices, although that's a weird image by itself, um, you would have seen these kinds of effects. So I think this is my last interim discovery. Um, what I've argued is that discovery involves uh, several discrete steps. And not everybody agrees with that. Um, I think that some of those steps involve social interaction, as I've described to you. Others are more solitary. But both kinds of steps, the, the social ones and the solitary ones, can be well supported by the environment that you're, that you're in. And again, I don't want to sound like a gushing fanboy, but I would say that I've seen abundant evidence here on Novartis campus of all kinds of ways in which the environment supports those kinds of processes that are part of creation, discovery, and inspiration. OK, and this is my last slide. And I, I have no intention of, of dwelling on this. Um, I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, uh, it, was, it was mentioned in the introduction. There is this vexed question of um, how we understand workplaces now in the era of work from home work versus working at the, at the office. And I have to tell you, I remember when, when we were first uh, locked down, uh, which now seems like such a long time ago, um, we were all, you know, scientists 
um, academics were doing webinars like crazy because we had, we had all of this excess activity where we'd normally be meeting colleagues and going to meetings and what have you, and we couldn't do that anymore. So it was always, it seemed to me, like, let's have another webinar. And uh, I remember at one of the first webinars that I did, I, I expressed the view that I really hoped that the outcome of this emergency would not be that we would struggle to find our way back to the way that things were before the pandemic, that we would use this as an occasion for reset, for, to reconfigure, to really think about what we wanted the future to be like. And I have to say I was maybe naively a little bit surprised by the extent to which the outcome of that has been the strong sentiment that, that many of us could and should be able to work from home, maybe not all the time, but, but most of the time. Um, I think that you've all probably done some working from home. We all had to for a while. You've experienced the pros and cons, and there are both. There are some lovely things about, about working from home. I do it sometimes as well. There are some liabilities as well. For me, the big one is work-life balance. Oddly enough, a lot of people say, I have great work-life balance working from home. My feeling is, I never stop working because my workplace is the place where I live, so I'm always, I'm always on. And I hear lots of complaints about that from other members of my family. So there's all of that, but I think here in a place like this and in other places throughout the world, and there are lots of them, and not necessarily always having to do with scientific discovery, there are special things that can happen in a workplace that can be supported by um, an environment. And my fear is that those kinds of things, although we stumbled along for a long time as things were during lockdowns, over the course of a long period of time, will slowly wind down and discover that our work lives, our energies are not as effectively deployed in the workplace as they were before any of this happened. It takes a very long time to measure these effects. So I have a very low level of certainty about, about anything that I'm saying. Um, and I don't have a brain image right now to show you, so <laughs> there's no reason you should, you should believe that. But I think, you know, to, to, to summarize, I think that it's a really, a really complicated question. It's, it's really easy to, um, to, to not take into account all of the nuances and all of the ways in which um, uh, a, a workplace can, su can support your psycholog psychological state and to make you do better work. And I think, you know, recently I've been, I've been grumbling to people that I talk to about, you know, if it's, if it's so hard to convince people to come back to the workplace, then maybe that's a statement about what happens in uh, the design, the architecture of workplaces. That if, if I think of the place that I work, for example, and now I'm starting to ramble, so I'll stop myself very quickly. But I th if I think of my own workspace, just to bite the, hands, the hand that feeds me a little bit, it's miserable. There's, there's, uh, there are very few reasons to go there other than for places of social interaction. And then when I compare it to a place like this, I feel like this is the dream. Like if this, if this can't work, if this kind of environment can't support discovery, then I throw my hands up in despair. Um, <laughs> finito, thank you for listening. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Colin. Thanks for your fascinating insights. And I can reassure you, actually, we have some space here. So we could actually bring your lab and everything on this campus. <laughs> so, so, do you, do you mean, want to shake so, on that right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be a little bit careful. But yeah. um, we can, yeah. we're going to start work on that. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the opera is waiting as well. However, we have like maybe some time to um, get some questions, there are micros around. I mean, someone here that would like to ask. OK, yeah, we have questions like here in the middle. Let's wait for the micro. Okay. Hi, I just wanted to ask, thank you, by the way, for the beautiful talk. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the place of novelty in architectural awe, because Familiarity can also, you know, reduce the effect of architectural awe 
does somebody who's been working at Novartis campus for 20 years or <laughs> since <laughs> it was created experience the same moments of all? Uh, well, the campus has been developing over 20 years, so probably still yes. But what is the relationship between novelty and awe and familiarity? That is a great question. Thank you for asking that question. It's, a, it's an important question too, and it's, it's one that um, I'll take the, the wishy-washy way out as a first approach and tell you that we just don't know. Um, we, but we can, nobody's, nobody's looked at this. And you know, I do all research and I'm looking at myself and thinking, why haven't I done this yet? But it's, it's not that easy to do because it's a, it's a long-term proposition to understand that. My, my guess from things that I know about how brains and minds work is that what you're saying is true, that there would be um, the development of familiarity over time. But my guess is that there would still be moments. I think what happens in the day-to-day -day is that, you know, we get used to, I, when I walk to work, I take the same route every time, and you would think there'd be nothing new. And then once in a while, I just, I wake up, and I can feel that epiphany that, oh my goodness, I, I never saw this tree before, and what an interesting and complicated shape it has. So I think even over the passage of long periods of time, you can still have those kinds of experiences of epiphanies that, that happen unexpectedly. But if you, if you build them into, if you build opportunities into an environment, then you're more likely to have them more, more often than in a sterile, really boring environment, like the one that I work in. <laughs> you have a question over there? And there as well, yeah, okay, like where the micro is faster and then <laughs> we won't lose that one. Yes? Go ahead. Thank you, first, first of all, Colin. It's a very interesting presentation. As you have spent some time going around the campus, what was the place, the building, that created this epiphany moment for you and why? I show... Apart, apart from the opera. Well, <laughs> hey! You, you've taken away one of my number one picks. Um, I, I showed some, some of the slides that I put in here, I added yesterday as, as a consequence of my walking around campus. And, uh, and, and the opera was definitely one of them. Um, the, um, and I, I couldn't tell you what building this is in, but I showed you the images of that, that beautiful forest of birch trees in the middle of, of a building, which for me was, was such a stunning discovery that we were in that building for some other reason, I think. And then I, I said, you know, we, we had a quick look. And then I said, can I go back? And I just, I think the, uh, my, the, the people who were helping me just left me to sit there for, you know, half an hour or so because it was just so, that's not the kind of thing that you expect to find. Um, even something simple like a, uh, the, the meadow of wildflowers that I showed was just such a, uh, for well, it wasn't, it wasn't really serendipitous because the people who were leading me, the person who was leading me in that segment knew exactly what he was doing. <laughs> and he knew, I, I know what's going to get to you, it's going to be this. But if I had found that by myself, again, that would be, I think, a prime example of one of those moments. They don't have to be mind-blowing uh, light and sound displays. They can sometimes be really, really subtle. Just unexpectedness uh, has a profound effect, I think, on, on how we think. You had a question over there, like you can see. It's up there, yeah. You'll get the micro, you'll get, you'll get it. Um, hi, and thank you for the interesting talk. I just would like to know if you had the chance to go into any of the buildings and see the inner space. The outer space is great, as we have seen. I wonder if you had the chance to visit any of the inner space, and especially some of the older buildings. I did, I did. Not, and not what was your feeling about it? Not as many buildings as I would have liked to have gone in. I, I wish that I had much longer to, to stay here and just absorb everything. But the buildings that I went into just, just struck me as, uh, first of all, each one having its own special character, um, its uniqueness, um, the very careful use of, of materials and textures, the use of wood, for example, in, in this building and many others, uh, the use of, of natural stone. Um, everywhere I looked in the interiors, just like the exteriors, I saw that there was a, such a careful eye for, for detail. These, uh, obviously, they're not, um, they're not run-of-the-mill buildings. Each of these buildings was designed by 
somebody who had really spectacular architectural skills. So you would expect that. But the, the accumulation, accumulated impact of seeing all of that, even in the small number of buildings that I saw, was just uh, like nothing I've ever seen before. Thank you, hello. Um, I was wondering, you said that openness or open spaces promote this creativity and this, um, yeah, creativity. And, um, but what about people on, like, who don't need to be creative in their daily work life? They just need to be able to sit down, focus on a task and get it done. And that quietness, <laughs> is detrimental to, their be, to them being able to, to focus. But now with these open spaces, so especially open space offices where there are, I don't know, 50 people in, 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 a, in a room, um, how, how efficient do you think is that? Because what I've seen inside the buildings, some of the buildings that you come in, you search for this meeting room that you're invited to, and you're not quite sure where the room is, and somebody asks you, can I help you <laughs> from the office? And I'm like, yes, I'm looking for this meeting room. Oh, it's just around the corner. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, I, I don't feel it's much social collaboration there. It's more like we're afraid to talk now because we might disturb somebody? Yeah, those, those are great questions. And I, I, think, I think that I had as one of my bullets on the, on the work from home slide that I didn't really elaborate on, that, that um, d d maybe this was, was more implicit than explicit in that slide. But I think you're right. I think that different kinds of work roles are better supported by different kinds of environments. And if, you're, if your job is basically sitting and coding, for example, all day long, um, I think, I think you, know, you still need cognitive relief in a position like that, but nevertheless for your work function, maybe it's okay, it probably is okay to be in that kind of dedicated uh, workspace. I think you're, you're raising the issue of open offices and open environments is, is important. That's, that's something that um, the, I think the pendulum has really gone back and forth on that over time. Um, I mentioned kind of tongue-in-cheek the glossy business magazines that touted the advantages of the open office because there was this idea that, look, just throw everyone into a space and the chemistry will be there so that great things will happen. And I actually, f I, I didn't think there was time to fit it all in, but I actually had a couple of slides showing uh, a study that was done not that long ago in 2018 that looked at... Um, it was a, it was a pre-post study. So it was a company that had had at least semi-closed, if not completely closed working environments, and then they'd gone fully open. And what the researchers did, it was quite clever. They had people wear devices that uh, had Bluetooth that allowed them to measure quite accurately the amount of time that people spent in face-to-face -face conversations and the amount of time that people spent on emails and text messages in the office. And what they discovered is that after conversion to the open office, face-to-face um, -face interactions just plunged. People, people weren't going up to each other to talk. They were instead, you know, even if you're not far away, and I think, again, we've all probably experienced this send a text or an email to someone down the hall or even in the office. I've done it with people in the office next door even. Um, so I think that the moral there is not necessarily that open collaborative environments are necessarily all bad. Um, I think the, the real issue is that you, part of, I think, supporting worker well-being is giving people choices. And I think pe you know, people are, are smart. They know, uh, for the most part, what kinds of setting might suit their work in the moment. So if you're, if you're coding or having a phone call with somebody or you know, doing something that's inherently solitary, um, then it should be fine and, and possible for you to go to an isolated space. You shouldn't be forced into being in a completely open space all the time, as for some time many people were and probably, probably still are. I've seen every kind of workspace arrangement from a cubicle farm to assembly line kind of tailorist organizations to completely open. And it seems to me the key is always to give people some agency to be able to figure out what kinds of things work 
uh, for them in the moment given their various tasks. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I felt like I just rambled on endlessly there, so. <laughs> Maybe one last question so that we can go to the um, apero. Like, there's one in the middle? Ah, uh, and one here, so, okay. Thank Sorry. you very much once again for your wonderful presentation. My question is just derived in my head about this feeling of AVE. So could it have a less lasting effect? Since quite frequently, I would say people just get used to what they see every day and it does not yeah, give them those fascinating feelings every time. So is there any secret? I understand also that it also depends much on personality. But if you know about the statistics, or is there any secret in architecture that can constantly give you those goosebumps? Oh, so uh, tips and tricks for, for uh, ramping up awe. Um, <laughs> I, this, this might sound odd, and this is just completely off the top of my head, but I, I feel like one possibly, possibility might be to to hide it a little bit, to make it a little bit more subtle, so not have it in your face obvious. I think even if it is in your face obvious, I think for, for most people, as I, as I said earlier, I think that, that those kinds of feelings of, of immensity and epiphany will bounce back, sometimes in unexpected times. You know, I, I always remember a long time ago, I went to visit a professor in California, um, University of California in Santa Barbara, and it had the most fantastic setting. Um, uh, in, in one direction, there were mountains, and in the other direction, there was an ocean. So I was sitting with this man in a completely open, like virtually all glass office, talking to him. And I said, you know, I can't even pay attention to what you're saying because I'm so like, <laughs> distracted by all of the stuff around me. And he said, you know, you just get used to it. But then he said, but sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll turn and then suddenly it just washes over me all over again and, uh, and, and changes the way that I feel for the rest of that, at least the rest of that day. So it's still like we, we're, just, we're just beginning down this road of understanding what awe is, how it gets the, that way and how it can be used to, um, to make life more pleasurable and, and maybe to make work environments work better for certain kinds of things. Those are exactly the kinds of questions, the one that you asked, uh, that that we need to confront, and you know, I'm I'm still at the stage, along with all of my colleagues, of I'm literally waving my arms to try to come up with a way of explaining this, and the the data is not there yet, but it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Thanks a lot, and once more, a nice applause to you. I think there's also an, an invitation to everyone that works here to explore the possibilities every day and all the guests from the outside come back and explore the possibilities here as well. And now you can explore our apero with, a little, with some bites here and um, outside you're very welcomed to um, spend some more time with us. Thanks a lot and see you soon.